uh, making it this early on a, a, a rainy <laughs> Friday morning. I uh, really appreciate it. And thanks to the organizers for this fantastic opportunity. It's really great to be back at uh, MLCB uh, in person. And uh, this, uh, MLCB has become one of the symbols of uh, the Comp Bio field and how it's matured over the years. And looking at the poster session last night and your talks, uh, I really see how far we've come in really blending and merging uh, machine learning concepts with biology, and it makes me really excited about the future of the field. So um, first to give some background. Um, so a lot of our work is focused on uh, dissecting the tumor microenvironment uh, in, and specifically in uh, specimens from patients, the patient samples. And because of that, because of the complexity of patient samples, uh, we have to uh, take you know, additional uh, care and rigor in designing methods that uh, are adapted to uh, answering questions in this context. And uh, the tumor microenvironment just briefly is uh, consists of this uh, system of uh, diverse tumor cells uh, that are interacting with support cells, uh, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, as well as a wide variety of uh, I don't know if you see my mouse, uh, maybe not, as well as a variety of uh, immune cells, but I don't see it here on my screen, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, the immune cells that are infiltrating the tumor and try to uh, eliminate uh, the cancer cells. And uh, so uh, why is the tumor microenvironment important? Uh, we know now that uh, there's a lot of great, uh, strong evidence that uh, the genetic alterations are not uh, the, the, the only driver of uh, response and uh, the outcome of patients and the microenvironment also plays a significant role and this heterogeneity of microenvironments across patients and within the tumors uh, is important to dissect at multiple molecular layers, uh, phenotypic, epigenetic, and so on. And so uh, the problems that we focus on, and uh, Bianca in her beautiful keynote yesterday uh, highlighted uh, and introduced these concepts of uh, uh, dynamics, but uh, some of the major problems we focus on is using single cell resolution, uh, multi-omics uh, to understand the dynamics uh, and altered cell, cell state dynamics that happens in early stages of cancer initiation as well as uh, combining time series single cell data sets to look at temporal dynamics and how uh, cell states change and evolve over time, in particular in response to treatments. Uh, in parallel, we also look at spatial dynamics and modeling how the spatial organization of cell types, diverse cell types in the patient tumor microenvironment also affects uh, the response and outcome. And through this uh, modeling of uh, both uh, temporal and spatial dynamics, we also uh, want to derive principles about the uh, interactions between uh, diverse cells. And uh, the major methods and uh, models that we build are of the probabilistic flavor, and uh, this audience uh, does not need any uh, convincing about the uh, advantages, uh, the theoretical guarantees, the interpretability, uh, and the adaptability of these frameworks, especially for integrating multiple data modalities and ability to do hypothesis testing. So in the first part, uh, I want to talk about uh, some of our work on uh, modeling spatial dynamics. Uh, and uh, this uh, project was uh, uh, started with uh, my, some of my previous uh, postdoc work where we were interested to know what's the impact of the tumor microenvironment in uh, the diversity of immune cell states. Uh, so what, what, how do they change once they encounter the tumor cells? And in particular, we wanted to compare these uh, diverse immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. How are they different from those found in the healthy tissue, uh, especially from the same, uh, same patient? And to do that, we looked at breast cancer patients uh, and matched samples from the tumor, uh, from healthy tissue, from bilateral mastectomies, as well as lymph node and peripheral blood and sorted CD45 uh, positive immune cells and did single cell uh, profiling and generated the first single cell breast immune atlas uh, that revealed a, a diverse set of distinct uh, cell states. And uh, in particular, some of the important highlights of the study was that there's uh, an indeed a significant increase in the diversity of the immune cells uh, when going from the healthy tissue. Uh, once they encounter the tumors, we see a significant increase in the all major pro uh, cell types of T cells, myeloids, and uh, NK cells. And uh, for those interested, how did we quantify this diversity? We devised this metric called a phenotypic volume, which looks at uh, the pseudo-determinant of the gene-gene covariance matrix. 
And so uh, this intuitively, the geometrical interpretation is the volume that is uh, that spans the eigenvectors characterizing the gene gene co-expression matrix. And so if you have, for example, in the tumor, uh, higher numbers of uh, co-expressed uh, genes, uh, modules of genes that are independent from those found in the healthy tissue, you expect uh, additional eigenvectors uh, and more independence uh, of eigenvectors to be adding to this volume and uh, showing this increase. So in addition to this inc uh, increase in the diversity, one of the surprising results from the study was uh, about the uh, trajectory uh, of T-cell differentiation and activation. Uh, so if you look at the T-cells going from uh, the, uh, at the bottom of the arrow, from uh, more naive central memory T-cells, going to effector memory cytotoxic T-cells, um, we expected that, you know, just like textbook models of immunology, there should be distinct and defined states of uh, differentiation along these, this axis, as well as activated T cells and exhausted T cells. But we were surprised that this uh, distribution actually looks very continuous. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, the diffusion component, uh, an axis explaining the variance across all T cells, you see that it, it's uh, the, the least uh, activated in blood and normal tissue as expected highly activated in the lymph node, but in particular in the intratumoral uh, uh, T cells uh, shown in the uh, light blue on the right, you see a very continuous distribution. And so that was surprising for us. And we thought, could it be explained by uh, the fact that there are so many uh, antigen specific T cells that we're aggregating, maybe the TCR, the T cell receptor uh, profiling of that can help uh, deconvolve them. So we did pair TCR and single cell. And the answer was no, that uh, the uh, T cell chronotype identity actually doesn't fully explain uh, this continuity. Uh, when we looked at defining, you know, rough clusters, even though they're not distinct, and looking at the expression of signatures shown here in rows of these heat maps related to responses to microenvironmental stimuli, we see that the clusters show different combinations of levels of expression of uh, rep representing responses to these stimuli. So. The hypothesis that we took away from this was that maybe we have T cells uh, ex exposed to different niches in the tumor microenvironment that are also differing in the levels of uh, oxygen, nutrient supply, uh, it's uh, activating ligands and cytokines and so on. And because of that, uh, we're looking at the aggregated uh, from uh, dissociated tissues in single cell profiling and therefore seeing a continuous distribution. So the answer was, okay, let's do spatial. <laughs> now we have spatially resolved uh, technologies that can uh, you know, uh, uh, resolve uh, the phenotypes uh, in the spatial context of the tissue. And again, uh, thanks to Bianco for introducing uh, spatial methods. Um, we continued our collaboration with uh, Sasha Rodensky and George Cletus at uh, Sloan Kettering uh, to do uh, Visium uh, spatial transcriptomic profiling of uh, breast tumor tissues and to try to understand if the spatial organization defines immune uh, differentiation and stromal response. We were also particularly interested to compare spatial organizations across tissues. For example, uh, in metaplastic breast cancers, these are a type of triple negative breast cancers that are more aggressive. Uh, they actually grow on chemotherapy, unlike uh, other triple negatives, and they have different morphologies, very heterogeneous morphology, uh, uh, if you, you can see on the histology slides, some of them look like soft tissue and some connective tissue. And so there's a lot of demand uh, tailored for this very aggressive sub, uh, uh, subtype uh, that, you know, is adapted to the unique biology of, of this uh, uh, breast cancer. But uh, to be able to compare spatial organization of cells uh, across samples, uh, we need uh, new methods as well. Uh, also, in addition to that, uh, as many of you know, the spatial transcriptomic technologies which look at sampling the entire transcriptome are limited in their resolution. They're not exactly single cells. So you have a mix of multiple cells uh, within uh, every spot shown here uh, in, in the zoom, zoom out uh, plot here on the top left corner. And so this is a problem when you're looking at uh, complex patient samples because you have mixing of immune cells that you're trying to compare across tissues with patient-specific tumor cells. And because uh, they're patient-specific, there's not gonna be any overlap uh, between spots. And uh, so uh, in particular, if we want to really deconvolve the refined cell states like activated T cell states from exhausted T cell states, we need methods that are able to deconvolve uh, spots at that resolution. And when looking at uh, 
there are many great methods out there now for deconvolving spatial transcriptomic data, the majority of those that are able to get these refined cell states rely on a single cell reference uh, that is from the same match sample. And this has its limitations, um, but also it's, uh, you know, uh, something that might be limiting when you're looking at patient samples and you don't, might not have enough material. So a uh, number of brilliant students in my lab, uh, CU, you know, and Ashil, and also my postdoc LinkedIn, uh, who worked a lot on the interpretation, uh, thought together <laughs> about uh, how can we address these issues to deconvolve cell states without the need for a single cell reference, uh, and also leverage all this um, information that we have on the histology imaging. Uh, this is what the pathology uses for, for you know, the, uh, uh, the annotation and the diagnosis. So uh, it, it has a lot of information about the density of the cells, the tissue architecture. So why not in integrate these two data modalities to improve our understanding of the spatial dynamics? And most importantly, we wanted to build a framework that is able to do comparative analysis of multiple tissues. So this led to Starfish. Uh, I'm not going to read the full name. <laughs> I, I leave the naming of tools to my students. So uh, they come up with these uh, very long acronyms. Uh, but the idea is to combine spatial transcriptomics and histology. So uh, to give an intuition on uh, how we avoid the need for, uh, for, for uh, single cell references, uh, I'm going to show a cartoon uh, that is, uh, well, uh, uh, simulated data that is uh, based on, uh, generated based on mixtures uh, from a single cell RNA sequencing data uh, with a known mixture levels from a breast cancer uh, tumor uh, data set with five major cell types, uh, CAPS or fibroblasts. Uh, tumor cells, myeloids, normal, and T cells. And you can see the UMAP, just like the UMAP of any uh, spatial transcriptomic data, doesn't show defined clusters of cell types because you have these mixtures. But at the corners, you see those are spots that are enriched for markers of known markers of cell types. Now, we thought, okay, if a user has knowledge of the markers of these cell types, can we use those as guidance for the deconvolution? But in many cases, especially in patient-specific tumors, you don't have accurate uh, markers for those uh, cell types. And so the idea we uh, used is uh, the concept of archetypal analysis, basically fitting a polytope to uh, the uh, low-dimensional representation uh, of, of the data and the extremities, the vertices of this polytope are the extreme states that uh, the spots can reach. Uh, and our major assumption is that those extreme points represent uh, the purest spots in our data, meaning they're either consistent of one cell type or dominant in uh, mainly one cell type. And uh, we recently tested this assumption, thanks to our reviewer as well, <laughs> on uh, Xenium single cell resolution data. And it, indeed, uh, it is uh, a correct assumption. And uh, then finally, we align uh, this, if there's information about the known markers, uh, we align the archetypes to kind of adapt our marker set and the known marker sets to the context of this tissue, and then use these uh, anchors to kind of pull apart uh, the rest of the spots we get these starfish-like uh, shapes, hence the name. Uh, and then we show with uh, this data that the, the, it fits uh, the data. For the more technical details, uh, what exactly do we do? Uh, we have, uh, so X here is our transcriptomic data expression of uh, cell I, sorry, spot I uh, in gene G. Uh, we have a variational autoencoder mapping it to a latent uh, space uh, Z. And uh, Z is centered around uh, a weighted sum of our anchors, which we also learn. But we, in you know, this pre-processing step, they are guided by uh, the definition of the archetypes. And then C here gives you the proportions of the cell types, uh, which you also learn. Uh, theta is just the gene dispersion. L is library size, similar to uh, other deep, uh, generative models. And uh, finally, we have this additional data modality, the histology image, as a second autoencoder, uh, but a mapping from the same joint latent space. And again, Bianca mentions the uh, advantages and benefits of uh, learning a, a joint representations from multiple data modalities. We indeed see that it helps with improving the deconvolution of tumor cells and uh, fibroblasts uh, using this uh, in integration. Uh, so we, sh we show on simulated data, we do as good as methods that use a single cell reference, even without uh, using it, uh, but significantly improve over methods uh, that don't. Uh, this is now has been expanded to uh, higher numbers of cell types. Uh, we use data set uh, recently matched Xenium, so single cell resolution, but uh, lower dimensional, 
and Visium data from the same uh, from adjacent slices of this uh, of the tissue uh, to actually evaluate are we getting the correct uh, deconvolution so uh, here you can see two types of uh, invasive tumor cells at the bottom and non-invasive ductal carcinoma in situ cells on the top and you can see it does align uh, with the inferred uh, proportions from the Visium uh, uh, data uh, but what was really interesting was uh, that we found the archetypes actually were able to deconvolve kind of in a hierarchical manner, further distinguish two different subsets of these non-invasive DCIS cells uh, shown at the uh, far right there that are exactly aligned with expert annotated regions shown in the red and yellow uh, in the histology. And so without any knowledge about what are the markers that disentangle these two more refined subsets, we found archetypes that exactly uh, match them. So what do we learn about the spatial dynamics? So here, uh, this is an example of a triple negative uh, breast cancer tumor. Uh, first, we define spatial hubs or neighborhoods uh, by grouping spots that have similar inferred uh, composition of cell types. And so now we can look uh, across these spots that are high in tumor cells, uh, define trajectories uh, of how the phenotypes change, uh, are changing uh, and evolving across these spots. And we can see, for example, going from the cyan to the higher uh, uh, top uh, left part of the tissue, uh, we have a reduction in uh, cell adhesion molecules, an increase in mesenchymal markers and EMT. So really showing that their cells, uh, the tumor cells are changing from more basal states to more mesenchymal states within the same uh, tumor uh, tissue from a patient. Um, so now, how, do, how are the immune cells changing uh, if, if the tumor cells are adapting and changing in phenotype? We see that, uh, interestingly, as uh, there's this shift in the tumor states, we also have a shift from more central memory to effector memory cells, and also and then activated CD8 T cells at the margin of the tumor, and also shifts from monocytes to macrophages. Uh, so this really kind of goes back to the hypothesis that we started with, that there are indeed different immune cells associated with different different niches uh, of the tumor microenvironment and uh, the, the tumor cell they're interacting with actually does uh, uh, impact or determine the immune cell uh, uh, phenotype as well in the sp same uh, spatial neighborhood. So in addition to this integration of histology uh, and spatial transcriptomics without requiring a reference, uh, Starfish is also able to integrate multiple tissues and uh, create these atlases of spatial hubs or neighborhoods across multiple tissues and then do downstream analyses uh, like just what I showed, uh, this uh, pseudo space or how uh, phenotypes change across the space of the tissue and then do cell-cell interaction prediction. So this is an example of an integrated space of uh, uh, 14 samples, uh, 14 breast tumor samples, triple negatives and metaplastics. You can see the UMAP is just showing clusters that are patient specific, no overlap, despite the fact that there is common immune cells among them. Uh, whereas starfish is uh, showing a uh, merged and blended uh, a mixed uh, latent space with more mixing in the immune cells like T-Rex and uh, less mixing in uh, tumor cell, tumor, uh, high, in tumor enriched spots. Uh, also quantified with entropy, and then you can also see uh, the, the space colored by the spatial hubs. So now with the spatial neighborhoods defined, we can see what type of neighborhoods are, uh, for example, enriched in the metaplastic breast tumors shown uh, as MBC here. Uh, uh, for example, hub zero is one, uh, one case, or uh, what are the uh, types of hubs that are common across all breast tumors? And uh, just as sanity check, uh, we also compared to, you know, uh, annotated, expert annotated histologies, we do see that, for example, that uh, blue uh, hub there in the middle uh, is aligned uh, with a healthy annotated uh, tissue from, uh, from a uh, pathologist. Also between two adjacent slices at the bottom in the middle, uh, we have reproducible hubs uh, identified uh, showing um, it works on replicates and gives same results. Uh, but mo most importantly, we can compare across samples. So how do the tumors, how are the spots in metaplastic uh, breast tumors in the intratumoral regions uh, compared to the triple negative? So looking again at uh, this uh, joint latent space, we find that uh, there's an increase in inflammatory response, but more interestingly, in immunosuppressive cell types, such as regulatory T cells and myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or MDSCs, in the metaplastic breast tumors. 
In addition to that, we also see an increase in perivascular like cells, uh, which uh, might uh, indicate angiogenesis. And uh, we also see interesting uh, stromal hubs in the metaplastic uh, uh, tumors with a very concentrated uh, organi uh, organization shown in these red pockets across the metaplastics that are also uh, exactly overlapping with the regions that are high in hypoxia. So low oxygen levels, uh, regions are forming these uh, uh, regions that are high in immunosuppressive cell types like regulatory T cells, and we also see an increase in perivascular-like cells. So we think that the regulatory T cells might be uh, 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 contributing to building these uh, immunosuppressive niches and potentially adapting by angiogenesis, and we, in, if you zoom in in the histology, we also see some red blood cells uh, forming around the region, uh, so uh, there's an interesting connection with the immune cells. We validated these immunosuppressive niches uh, recently with codex data profiling based on uh, markers that we found in, the, uh, in, in, in our uh, transcriptomic level uh, deconvolution. And lastly, we looked into predictions. Can we predict from the deconvolved gene expression profiles uh, what might be the receptor ligands that mediate interaction between the regulatory T cells and the tumors? And FGF2 pathway was one that is coming up a lot and does show this decline by distance only in the metaplastics and not in the triple negatives and uh, ERs. So I want to wrap up this first part. Uh, I showed uh, Starfish, a deep generative model that uses anchors guided by archetypes that uh, replaces the single cell reference, does in image integration and comparative analysis of tissues. And I showed some uh, uh, results about insights we get in comparing uh, metaplastics and uh, uh, the uh, enriched immunosuppressive niches. I want to move on now to temporal dynamics as another perspective to look into cell-cell uh, interactions. and. Uh, in particular, longitudinal profiling, uh, profiling of tissues at multiple time points, uh, for example, before and after immunotherapy, uh, which can tell us how are the immune cells changing uh, once the patient is given immunotherapy in the tumor microenvironment, which ones are infiltrating, uh, which ones are dysfunctional in the patients that are not responding to the treatment, and how can we uh, reverse uh, the immune dysfunction. So in our uh, uh, paper published earlier this year with in collaboration with uh, Ben Iser, we looked at anti-PD-1 therapy uh, uh, treated uh, melanoma patients and uh, looking at single cell RNA sequencing at multiple time points before and after, uh, we see, for example, cases uh, like this red clone uh, defined from infra-CMV that is shrinking and responding to the uh, treatment, so it disappears in the on, uh, on therapy uh, samples. But we also see cases like this purple clone that you see it expands in proportion. It's at, uh, seen at very small uh, proportions pre-therapy and uh, significantly expands. So, and this patient was a non-responder. So the, there are, you know, some uh, uh, clones in, in the tumor microenvironment that are resistant. And uh, we wanted to know, is there any difference in terms of the spatial organization of the immune cells around these resistant clones compared to the responsive clones? And um, indeed applying starfish to slide seq data now instead of visium, uh, we were able to disentangle activated from dysfunctional CD8 T cells and saw, saw that the activated CD8 T cells are only uh, uh, co-localized with the responsive t uh, tumor clones, whereas we see dysfunctional T cell clones, uh, T cells uh, uh, co-localized with the uh, resistant clones. And so this level of, uh, you know, disentangling of T cells was not possible again with other methods, for example, R RCTD, uh, uh, methods that don't rely on single cell resolution. Uh, in other cancer contexts, for example, in leukemia, uh, we try to uh, draw principles about uh, response and resistance to immunotherapies from established types of therapies. For example, donor lymphocyte infusion is a uh, adoptive cell therapy that's given to leukemia patients that relapse after stem cell transplant. And we don't know exactly how they work. Uh, they used to work uh, very effectively for chronic myelogenous leukemia patients before imatinib and targeted treatments. Uh, today, they are the standard of care for AML patients, acute myeloid leukemia patients that relapse, uh, but they don't work as well. They work up to 20, 30% of patients. And so we wanted to see, can we draw uh, you know, uh, uh, principles about DLI response from CML cases, CML patients, and uh, use that to uh, guide how we can improve treatments for AML. 
and in, a, in my previous uh, postdoc work, we focused first on CML and uh, using Gaussian process regression models that I won't talk about today. Uh, we uncovered two major subsets of T cells that uh, are uh, in particular this uh, uh, dark blue uh, cell types that, uh, sorry, uh, light blue cell types that uh, are exhausted, but also have stem-like properties. And uh, they expand after treatment and we think they are shaping the response. And uh, we wanted to see if they're coming from the infusion, the therapy itself, or is the therapy reinvigorating uh, interactions among, T among immune cells in, uh, in the tumor microenvironment using T, uh, T cell receptor data. And our data was suggesting that it's rather the latter and uh, it's uh, in invigorating interactions across cell types. So that really motivated uh, looking at and trying to model interactions between uh, cell types um, in the tumor microenvironment from this longitudinal data. So we started this collaboration with uh, Kathy Wu, uh, Dana Farber, Katie, a postdoc in her lab, Cameron, PhD student in my lab, uh, leading this project with Katie and also Shovik uh, Mani, uh, who was a master's student uh, in CS in my lab and now a PhD student uh, in, at Stanford. Uh, we worked on uh, this uh, project, uh, ambitious project of trying to compare uh, two different cohorts, uh, AML and CML, to try to understand how their uh, DLI response is different. And so just uh, creating this atlas of more than 400,000 cells, uh, we find there's a lot of uh, indeed uh, overlap in immune populations while uh, di there's distinct diverging leukemia trajectories. Um, but to get a cell-cell interactions, uh, you've probably heard of many uh, interaction prediction methods, NicheNet, CellChat, CellPhoneDB. Uh, they essentially look at differential expression of receptor ligands in clusters of single cells. Uh, and uh, the uh, you might uh, kind of even look, to, look talking to our biologists. Uh, it's really hard to prioritize which of these many hits uh, of predicted uh, receptor ligand interactions might be relevant to the context of this uh, disease. And so uh, our idea was: can we actually learn from the temporal dynamics of cell types uh, how which cell types might be interacting, and at least combine that with prior knowledge? For example, if we see a decline in tumor cells an increase in a T cell, maybe the T cell is inhibiting uh, the tumor cell. So that negative temporal correlation is informative about potential interactions. Um, so the idea of DISCO, dynamic intercellular interactions and single cell transcriptomics, is to exactly combine these temporal correlations with prior knowledge of receptor ligands to try to uh, uh, constrain the space of possible cell cell interactions, but also get time resolved interaction predictions. Because obviously after therapy, we expect a different set of cell cell uh, interactions uh, in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, the idea of the method is actually building on a beautiful previous work from uh, David and others uh, using Gaussian process regression network models where we have, uh, we model every cell type as a uh, Gaussian process shown in Y and, uh, in, and uh, we have latent features F1 uh, to FK uh, for K cell types, but we also have this uh, W uh, parameter here, which is also a Gaussian process uh, showing the interactions between cell types. And uh, so this model by itself is not identifiable. So the, our idea was to constrain Ws using this prior knowledge of receptor ligands uh, to uh, have, uh, you know, uh, improve the identifiability and also get time resolved uh, interaction. So this is now uh, public as well. Uh, feel free to use it. If you have time series single cell data, let us know uh, how it works. Uh, to show you uh, in, in our preprint, we show um, uh, the uh, performance on both simulated and also more controlled experiments, in vitro experiments with CAR-T uh, and cell line interactions. But here I want to show some exciting results on the full AML uh, cohort. We see that there's different types of T cells from what we found in CML, uh, actually potentially driving the interactions, more, more CD8 uh, Temra uh, cells that, uh, in addition to NK cells and other immune cells such as B cells, that are also uh, expanding in proportion uh, in uh, AML responders and inhibiting uh, the, the proportions of leukemia. So these uh, lines here, the line is showing the mean of the Gaussian process that we fit to the data points and uh, the confidence intervals are shown in shaded areas. 
But we also learn about interactions uh, and we can have time resolved interactions, uh, which cell types are interacting. Uh, for example, uh, after therapy, we see this, uh, these immune cell types, uh, the CD8 Temra, NK cells, increasing in proportion and uh, strongly interacting to inhibit the leukemia cells. And this uh, cool video by Shovik, if I can get it to run, uh, also shows how the proportions of cell types and the interactions change. So you can have predictions from the Gaussian process at any, at any time point. So, now it doesn't stop playing the video. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we're now looking into validating these interactions using uh, spatial uh, codex data uh, that I won't talk about today. But just to recap this uh, second part, um, DISCO is able to infer time-resolved cell-cell interactions. Uh, and in our AML uh, patient cohort, uh, it is uh, identifying coordinated immune networks. Uh, that were, are not found in more homogeneous leukemia, such as CML, uh, and this was possible with longitudinal single cell mapping. All right, so if we have a couple of minutes, I want to talk about another exciting project uh, now on the dynamics of cancer initiation, uh, keeping the best, saving the best for the last. Uh, so this project uh, is trying to get at, well, started with answering this question about tumor initiation. So uh, we know that, for example, chemotherapy, a lot of standard uh, therapies eliminate uh, the more, most mature uh, tumor cells. And these early precancerous cells that have stem-like properties are able to grow back, for example, uh, leading to uh, relapse and metastasis. And uh, we don't have very good markers for them in the majority of cancer types be because they are rare and hard to profile and characterize. So uh, our, uh, our question was, can we use, you know, uh, trajectory uh, inference uh, methods and single cell resolution profiling to try to reconstruct this uh, tumor initiation trajectories? And we focused on AML. Uh, so AML, a uh, bit more uh, background, uh, normal hematopoiesis is shown on the left. You have these hemat hematopoietic stem cells uh, at the root of the tree, uh, differentiating into progenitor cell types, and then uh, uh, differentiating into all your uh, white red uh, blood cells uh, continuously. And uh, in the context of AML, we have a block differentiation on the myeloid arm. And we think what's happening is that uh, the uh, cells that are either stem or progenitor uh, lead to precancerous cells uh, and then uh, through acquisition of uh, accumulation of mutations and alterations, they lead to leukemia cells. Uh, so towards the end of my postdoc, we collected uh, some data with uh, Vincent Lavalli, who now has his own lab at the University of Montreal, uh, and, and Donna, uh, looking at uh, multiple patients, 12 AML patients, uh, that we tried to focus on particular types of mutations, TET2 epigenetic mutations and NPM1 driver mutations, uh, to at least uh, have less heterogeneity. This is a very heterogeneous cancer type. And uh, again, we see that all of the main clusters, major clusters are patient specific. Uh, there is some overlap between patients in uh, this uh, lower left populations here on, in the T cells and B cells as expected because this is a myeloid uh, malignancy, the lymphocytes should not be affected. But what was surprising was the circled population here, uh, this immature population, also the Shannon diversity uh, quantifies the high mixing of multiple patients. So it's a, a population that's highly correlated with healthy hematopoietic stem cells but found in all 11 out of 12 patients. So that was interesting. We thought maybe th these, uh, this cluster includes some of the uh, precancerous cells. And so we found markers for them, uh, zoomed into this population by sorting for them, doing additional round of single cell profiling. And we saw that it consists of two major populations, one more stem-like and one more progenitor-like. Uh, and what was really cool was that we, when scanning for the mutation of the driver uh, NPM1 mutation, uh, which is, happens on the three prime end, that's why we chose this mutation, and leads to high expression, uh, so we could detect it from single cell RNA sequencing three prime data, uh, we saw that the mutation exists only on the progenitor-like cells and not on the stem-like cells. So this really kind of suggested that there's an, a direction of uh, mutation events accumulating, and uh, we really uh, wanted to study what are the transcriptional consequences of these mutations along the full uh, trajectory of tumor formation. So for that, we thought, okay, how about comparing these cells to healthy hematopoietic cells? And that turned out to be challenging when you compare these uh, now sorted cells in uh, purple uh, on the left 
uh, with a healthy uh, CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells in green, you see that uh, integration methods that basically don't show any overlap or any, you know, uh, idea of the global geometry. Uh, we also have this um, annotation of the state maturation stages of uh, the leukemia cells from BLAST1, BLAST0, uh, BLAST1, BLAST to 3 uh, we see that the ordering of these cell types doesn't make sense in any of these representations. It also doesn't make sense when we try to do batch correction, because batch correction is desi designed for correcting technical artifacts uh, between samples. So if you're comparing disease samples where the majority of the cell types are not found in the healthy tissue, it's just trying to force them to overlap. So uh, the, these methods shown on uh, at, at the bottom row are really showing trying to force the cells to overlap on top of each other, but they might be misleading in the interpretation. They can tell you, for example, in Surat that maybe it's the healthy cells branching and bifurcating to the BLAST2 and BLAST3, which are the more mature uh, uh, leukemia cells. Uh, so obviously uh, incorrect representation of the trajectory. So uh, two brilliant, talented students, Ashil and Joy in the lab, thought of uh, designing a new method that tries to address these issues. So essentially what, what we thought about is if we're trying to get an interpretable representation from two data sets, a, for example, normal and a perturbed or disease data set, uh, there must be shared uh, mechanisms between these two trajectories. For example, cell differentiation is a preserved mechanism between healthy hematopoiesis and leukemia. But they, they might also be diverging, so leading to very distinct uh, uh, cell states. So we thought, can we relax the assumption of uh, independent and orthogonal uh, latent components in our, our representation? Uh, and so uh, this, you know, is, it becomes uh, challenging, again, uh, dealing with identifiability. Uh, but the idea we came up, uh, and I'll show the details in a second, indeed shows that if you allow the factors, the latent factors, uh, in, in this case, deep generative model, to have correlations, uh, between them, they can exactly resolve and disentangle these uh, cell types shown on the right uh, that are distinct, whereas other uh, uh, VAE methods like SCVI completely overlap uh, these uh, cell types and do not distinguish them. So uh, what does, how does the method actually uh, work? Uh, what we have here is, uh, you know, really building on methods like SCVI. So we have this uh, VAE uh, mapping uh, X to Z, but the major novelty here is adding an additional layer uh, where the Z, the latent factor Z are uh, actually a uh, function of another uh, layer V, which is even lower dimensional, in, in our case, a two dimensional uh, variable. And uh, so uh, there are multiple advantages of this uh, defining uh, to, as, as a 2D space. We can directly use this model to visualize our data in a meaningful manner uh, and not have, not have to do UMAP or another uh, you know, uh, visualization method that distorts the geometry of the data. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, this uh, Z factors that are defined by uh, this uh, high, higher level characterization captured in the 2D space. Whereas the Z factors, kind of give you more refined cell state characterizations. Uh, in particular, in the same sample that I showed, we see that it uh, you know, nicely aligns this uh, green trajectory, healthy trajectory cell matura uh, with healthy cells maturing to, uh, uh, on, on this um, uh, green trajectory and also aligning that with the uh, purple trajectory of AML maturation with the correct order of the cell types. And then the second axis is telling us what's most different and distinct uh, between the two samples and exactly aligns with uh, the accumulation of uh, the MPKM1 mutation on the decipher two axis. Uh, in particular, we find this PROM1 marker uh, marking the progenitor-like population consistently in all of our AML patients. Uh, so potentially a marker that could be used for uh, guiding early detection uh, of the disease. But now we can use also the, these uh, axes, the cipher components to understand what are the mechanisms that are disrupted along the leukemic in, uh, initiation with MPM1 mutation. Um, I'm going to skip this. We also uh, compared to a wide variety of methods uh, to try to assess how well the cipher gives a faithful joint representations by defining two metrics. We wanted to uh, assess if these methods 
give us the correct ordering of cell types along the trajectories, while also, uh, you know, preserving the divergence uh, and bifurcation of the trajectories and not forcing them to overlap. And so, for example, we see some methods uh, like uh, UMAP, uh, they're great at preserving the order, but not as good in uh, preserving the divergence, uh, whereas other methods like uh, SCVI are the opposite and Decipher kind of has a good balance uh, between uh, the trade-off uh, between these two. We also have a basis decomposition that then looks at, uh, so the nice thing about this method is you also can get explicit uh, reconstruction of expression directly from the model. Uh, so uh, we can, any, any point in this 2D space, you can predict what is the gene expression of a cell that might be in that space. Uh, and you can basically look at now how uh, genes change along the, any trajectories across uh, clusters. And then we have a basis decomposition technique that also quantifies difference between uh, expression along a, a perturbed or disease trajectory and a healthy trajectory, uh, basically identifying the most dominant uh, patterns as uh, basis functions that we learn, uh, and then using the weights to quantify the distance between them. Um, I think I'll skip this, but very briefly to show that we found a lot of interesting insight into disruptive regulation uh, during AML initiation. We see uh, while we in the healthy uh, sample, we see a lot of coordinated TF expression. This coordination is completely lost in the leukemia samples, and we rather see uh, uh, especially uh, uh, multiple uh, homeobox Hox transcription factors around the time that NPM1 mutation happens. We validated these with uh, single cell attack seek as well. I want to end with saying that we started building this cipher with this question of trying to understand uh, cancer initiation, but we found that actually the representation we get by allowing the, the latent factors to be correlated gives us a lot of meaningful insight into other contexts. For example, this is uh, uh, T cells uh, infiltrating uh, melanoma tumors from 33 patients undergoing PD-1 therapy. And you can see in the UMAP, uh, they're just, uh, you know, uh, they're when you annotate them, but sometimes you, you, I'm sure you've seen the CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, they become mixed. They're not like, you know, partitioned properly. And you don't see any association with the timing of the therapy or response. Whereas with Decipher, you get this nice alignment of CD8 T cells going from naive CD8 uh, to uh, effector memory and exhausted CD8 T cells. And uh, it, in parallel, you have the naive CD4s going to uh, more differentiated CD4 T cells and regulatory T cells as their own uh, distinct cl uh, cluster. Uh, now, this, these axes are meaningful because we now see that they are actually associated with time of therapy, with response to anti-BD1, and the length, the duration of the therapy given to, given to the patient, which really tells us, uh, you know, uh, can guide uh, the administration of these therapies uh, to be uh, more effective, and we also get additional insight from the latent factors. Uh, this is very new. I just received this figure <laughs> last night. Uh, this is new work that we just started with uh, Bianca and uh, uh, lead, lead, led by Joy, ex extending the idea of Decipher to also integrate uh, single cell attack seek data. And we just get, see very interesting results uh, in the context of pancreatic cancer, where you don't get the correct uh, trajectories uh, of uh, ACNR cells transforming into uh, pancreatic cancer cells. Well, from the integration, you are able to resolve this uh, correct uh, transformation through ADM and PAN itself. Uh, so just summarizing a uh, deep generative model for the joint uh, hierarchical representation of uh, cells, for example, from two disparate contexts of healthy and disease. Uh, and this two layer dimension reduction really helps with interpolating between different degrees of uh, nonlinearity and gives you much more flexibility uh, and therefore more interpretability. Um, the biggest bonus is that you get a direct 2D visualization. Uh, feel free to try it. Uh, we'd love to hear about uh, your experience with this method. It is now online. And I wanna end with thanking the many people who are actually doing <laughs> all this uh, work. Uh, many people to thank in my lab. Uh, collaborators, uh, especially at uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, Sasha, and uh, Dana Farber, uh, Kathy's lab, uh, funding sources, patients for their samples, and most importantly, we have open positions, especially the <laughs> postdoc position joint with David's lab, uh, where we're looking for uh, 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 causal inference, uh, cancer genetics, cancer genomics, any interest in at the intersection of those, feel free to talk uh, to us. and. Uh, uh, we'd love to chat more about it, uh, and uh, thank you for listening early morning. <laughs>
All right. I think we have only yeah, a few minutes for questions. Uh, great, great uh, talk. So with is there any time you wouldn't want to use Decipher versus using STVI or, you know, doing Surat UMAP? Yes, when you have technical batch correction. So in cases, so we have one data set where we have three prime and five prime uh, chemistry. Uh, we want to align them because we know they're similar. So technical artifact, uh, but uh, Decipher, at, at least this version that doesn't do a batch correction, uh, does not uh, fully align them. So in that case, something like that makes it, something like SDVI makes more sense. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get a sense of the resolution of the cell types, how many cell types and what kind, and how did you uh, do the mapping between a cell and then cell type? Yeah, great question. So uh, if you have prior markers you want to use, if they're refined, uh, it will use those, try to disentangle them. It quantifies if they're overlapping a lot in terms of the archetypes, uh, and then it will collapse them. Uh, how the number of archetypes are chosen is based on an intrinsic dimensionality metric that we built in. So it's really a data-driven uh, calculation of number of cell types. But we have seen in all of our tumor samples, melanoma, uh, breast, lung, that it is able to disentangle very refined immune cell states. Uh, yeah, thank you. A uh, very nice talk. One, uh, one more question on Decipher. So I think uh, you briefly mentioned the uh, identifiability issue. So I was wondering, how did you make sure that the model would not like simply ignore one of the latent representation and degenerate to a vanilla like uh, variation of uh, autoencoder? Yeah, great question. So we don't have theoretical guarantee that it is identifiable, but because the space of the latent space is really much smaller, so the Z space is really 10, ten dimensional by default, you can, we've tried up to 30 as well, similar to SCVI, uh, it's just com because it's compressing 20,000 dimensions to 10 dimensions, it will try to make them as uh, you know independent as possible, but also uh, correlated if needed through this additional layer of V. Uh, so uh, we just see through practice so far that uh, we get very robust uh, representations uh, of Z factors and also the ordering of cells uh, along the trajectories that it infers through this minimum, minimum spanning tree. Uh, the length of uh, trajectories in the V space has also been uh, meaningful, uh, again, through practice. We are thinking of ideas on how to actually try to understand what is what are the theoretical uh, backings uh, for this, uh, but uh, that's that's a good question that we're following up on. Any questions for that one? So I just curious, with Starfish, um, you know, you're deliberately not using a reference. If you have a reference, are you able to leverage that and then learn additional like cell type archetypes on top? Exactly. So it's, it, there are three options. One is if you only want to use your reference, uh, you have high confidence in your markers, you can just use that. The second option is you have no markers, you just want to use archetypes. The third is combining both, so adapting your marker set. And it doesn't use the level of expression of the gene markers either, so that therefore you don't need uh, really single cell uh, data. Uh, even just gene names, lists of genes, uh, even a few uh, marker genes are sufficient. Uh, 